What's the first thing that comes to mind when you jump out of bed, or for the non-morning people, when you crack your eye open and crawl out of bed? Is it a grateful prayer that you're starting this day on the right side of the grass, or is it a prayer of, dear God, give me the strength to get through this day? Does your day start with, good morning, God, it's morning, or good God, it's morning? Each and every one has their own morning routine, and it changes from day to day and week to week. But we all have one. For some of us, the day doesn't start without a strong cup of coffee, or two, or three, or as many as that day may need. Others need to read their newspaper or check their cell phones. We all have a rhythm to our mornings that define our days. I have my own unique morning ritual. I really don't think most of you get up on a Sunday morning by going, it's time to worship, worship, worship. I, I could be wrong. If all of you gr jump up and greet the day that way, I'd love to hear it. But that's how I start my morning. And all of us have our own routines and unique ways of starting the day. But there's one thing that all of us have in common, and we have it in common with our brothers and sisters in the past. Many of us start the day by looking at the sky or by looking at an app on your phone that other people who looked at the sky can tell you. We define our day by what the weather is going to bring. For instance, this past weekend, you probably desperately watched the weather network to find out when you could mow your lawn or if you could mow it at all. And how often does what you wear be defined by the weather around you? If it's 100 degrees, it's not time to break out the parka. If it's minus 40, it's not time to break out the miniskirt. And you decide how faithful to Christ you're going to be on the weather, or whether or not you know that this is a day he's going to come back in glory. Okay, I'll be honest, the third option is really something the weather network's not tracking right now. But for many people, this can be the deciding factor in their life. And this, start, this way of thinking started when Jesus first ascended to heaven and left us in charge of preparing the way for the coming kingdom. And at times it feels like nothing changed, as people are still busy watching the sky in the hopes of seeing Christ come again in glory, coming to bring about this long-awaited kingdom where there will be peace and healing and reconciliation. And I know from time to time I've been tempted just to quickly peek out at the sky just in case this is the day when Jesus is coming. Whenever we're faced with a big decision in the church about what to do about a mission project or a big building project, I just feel that urge to look outside and be like, okay, God, j just in case you're interested, you, you could come and make this decision. You know, you could come and tell us what the right path is. And I don't think that I'm the only one. After all, think about how many people have spent their life trying to decode the Bible. Going through each verse and scripture passage, trying to find secret numbers that will let them know when the kingdom of heaven is going to come. It's gotten so bad that even the Simpsons have got in on the joke. And please note I say when he's going to come back, not if. For we know in our life that what goes up must also come back down but we're often impatient and want to know when. We want to know the exact date and time so that when Jesus comes, we can look busy. And I really don't think this is what the Son of God had in mind in his final lessons for those who would become his disciples, both in the past and those of us gathered here today. For Jesus doesn't tell us the date of the coming kingdom of heaven, not because he's hidden it like some Easter egg in scripture that we need to find, nor did he cause it to be hidden any other type of literature or building or painting or anything else Hollywood might think of. Because the signs of the coming kingdom of heaven aren't hidden at all. If you want to find them, simply look to your left and your right. For the signs of God's coming kingdom are found in his people. They're found in the faithful gathering together each week to come and worship, knowing that they're completely different from others in the pews, 
but knowing that the great creator loves them equally as one because he sent his only son to save all of us from ourselves. The kingdom of heaven is found in a place that offers safe space for those who are battling addictions to gather and find the strength they need to break that vicious cycle. It's where children are welcome and discover that family is more than just the family you're born into. The signs of the coming kingdom of heaven is found when people look beyond themselves to serve others, not for some earthly glory, but because it's the right thing to do, because the person you're helping is a beloved child of the living God, just as you are. We don't need to watch the skies to see when Jesus is coming, because he's always with us if we let him. This is a promise that Jesus gives to each and every one of us before he ascends into heaven. This power that he offers to those who dare to follow him. It's the gift of the Holy Spirit. The spirit that comes into our life through the sacrament of baptism. The spirit that leads us to find a church to call home. The spirit that invites us to be an active part in Jesus' ministry to the world around us. For the ascension of Jesus is not the end of his ministry, only the start of his second chapter that will be written by those who dare to follow him. This is why Luke chooses to record it both in the end of the Gospels and the start of the Acts of the Apostles. For yes, we have lost the ability to see Jesus face to face. And this is a loss, because life would be easier if we could see Christ all the time. But we've also been given a gift. We've gained the ability to hold Christ's spirit in our hearts, to allow Christ's spirit to move in our bodies, to open our eyes to see the world not how it is, but how it can be. It's the same spirit that invites us to be in the change in the world we long to see in both big and small ways. Think about it. What is it that inspires people to become doctors and nurses, who take on years of study and grueling work to serve those who are ill and needing help? It's God's spirit. And who inspires teachers to give everything they can to encourage and empower the next generation? Again, it's God's spirit. Who guides us to visit the sick to check on those who feel lowly, who gives us the ability to proclaim that death is forever defeated, even when we don't feel like it. It's the Holy Spirit. It's God's Spirit. It's Christ's Spirit. The third part of our Trinity allows us to do all of these things and so much more, all because Jesus sent it down to rest on his beloved disciples, those in the past, and those still yet to come. And we're given this gift not to hoard our knowledge and be secretive about it, but instead to spread it with what some would consider a reckless abandonment, sharing God's spirit in abundance and overflowing, trusting that when we spread the seeds of the coming kingdom of heaven, our great creator will help them to grow and flourish, just as it did with the early church long ago, and just as it happens in our own life. For this is the great gift that our Heavenly Father has given to all of his beloved people. For Christ came to save us, to teach us, to guide us, and then to show us to do the same with all those who we meet, so that one day all may come and worship the Lord of everlasting life. But until that day comes, Don't always keep your eyes on the sky looking for the Lord, for you just might miss seeing Jesus walking amongst his people and those who we serve and those who are called to serve us. Thanks be to God. Amen.